Question Lane is a podcast where the goal is to solve problems through the process of questions and answers. Today's guest is a content creator, writer, and public speaker. As a content creator, she focuses on race, pop culture, social justice, political activism, and socio-political theories. Today's series of questions and answers will be centered on Area 3 Entertainment, specifically her YouTube video entitled, Daniel Kalua is Bored of Talking About Race, I Guess. Our guest Seren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Perfect, perfect. How do you uh, pronounce your name on YouTube? Um, oh, it's Sensei Ashtamasu. Okay, okay. Can I just use Seren? Seren is perfectly fine. Perfect, that'll work. Uh, before we get started, is there anything you want us to know about you before we uh, get into the conversation? Um, anything you want to know about me? I mean, I, you kind of like addressed it all uh, in your intro. Um, I do also have a book out. Uh, it's called So About That, a year of contemporary essays on race and pop culture. If you Google it or type it in Amazon, you'll find it. For anybody that's interested in reading some of my um, essays. And I also am a contributing writer for the Art and Thought uh, online magazine Riot Material, Riot. So if you type that in, you can find me as well for anyone that's interested in hearing more about my ideas in addition to my YouTube. Perfect, perfect. I'll put the link to the book in the description as well. Thank you. Uh, so for people that may be unfamiliar with you, uh, are you a black woman? Yes, black American, descendant of American child slavery. Oh, you jumping ahead because I had a question about that too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I like to make it clear up front. <laughs> It's all good. That's why I'm asking these questions. So I suspect uh, as a black woman uh, who could have gotten a job in the business world and climbed the corporate ladder, uh, why did you decide to focus on writing about race and creating content surrounding race? Well, uh, six years ago in 2014, when Mike Brown was murdered by the state, I felt compelled to do something. Um, prior to that, I was also really impacted by, well, I was living in New York, and this was like 2012, so about eight years ago now. I was living in New York, and I got involved with Occupy Wall Street, um, which was sort of my first interaction with protest work and activism, and through Occupy Wall Street, I started learning about capitalism um, and actually became an anti-capitalist and I started seeing the way that kind of on the ground activism and, and coalitions worked um, and they had an Occupy camp in New York and they also had one in Washington DC which is where I'm from. I was born and raised in DC um, and they had an encampment in McPherson Square and basically the point of Occupy was to show kind of like autonomous communities existing outside of the state um, and outside of the capitalist system. And then one day the police came in the middle of the night and they raided the encampments and they tore everything down and they kicked everybody out. And that was one of my first brushes with, you know, the state. Um, and then shortly after that, Trayvon Martin was killed. And then a couple years after that, Mike Brown was murdered by the state. And it was sort of like, all these little things that were adding up, adding up, adding up. At that time, I was a teacher. I was working in the school system. Um, and I also had a lot of issues with the school system and with the fact that, you know, we hammer standardized testing into kids' heads and not actually, you know, teaching them things and not being able to use our creativity. And I just felt like what, like, everything inside of the system just wasn't working. That was how I was feeling. And then, after Mike Brown got killed, I basically just felt like, okay, that's it. Like, breaking point, I'm done. I don't believe in the system. I'm not engaging with it anymore. Can I curse? Is that okay? Uh, if you feel the need to. Okay. <laughs> fuck this. <laughs> like, I, 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 like, fuck everything. I kind of, I sometimes describe it as, like, I lost my mind, and then I never got it back. I never, I just basically decided, like, my life is about the liberation of, of black bodies from this system. That's why I'm here. That's my point. That's my purpose. That's what I need to, like, give my life to, like, fuck everything else. Um, and so I 
was doing a lot of writing on Tumblr at that time, and a lot of people said, because I was doing a lot of long-form writing, long-form content and essays and stuff, and a lot of people started asking me if I had ever considered doing videos and doing video content to make it a little bit easier to digest because I was like writing and writing and writing so much and I was very angry um, and it was like I was like a raw nerve being around me was like being around a raw nerve you know people would ask me like oh did you see that new movie that came out and I was like no did you see that my brown was laying in the street like I couldn't think about anything else I couldn't I just wasn't about anything else except liberating like black people from this system and so I started my YouTube channel almost as a cathartic way to get my feelings out in addition to my writing and people responded to it and um, people started having these really good conversations and dialogues in the comments. I moderate comments to keep out garbage and a lot of people felt similar to what I felt. They felt like they were not being represented. They felt like they were not being heard. They felt like they were turning on the news. The news was bullshit. The shit they were reading was bullshit. Everything was bullshit and nonsense. And like the whole system was against us. And I just kept going and going and going. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I wrote the book. And then I, um, in 2018, I launched my docuseries, The Black Americans, where I actually travel uh, across the country and I do sit down conversations with other black Americans, just, you know, conversations about how we feel and, and what's important to us and started organizing events and, you know, it just, it went, it went from there. It went from there. And so it wasn't really like a conscious decision of like, I'm not going to, you know, get a regular job and work anymore or whatever, but it was like I was compelled to, I felt like I had to do something. Like I went to Ferguson uh, after my ground was killed because I felt like I have to do something. Like just being online or being on Twitter or doing this and doing that is not enough. I need to like actually do something with my body. Like I need to be there. You know, I see that people are putting their lives on the line, you know, to fight for us, to fight for our liberation. And I need to also do what I can. I, I have to. You know, it almost it wasn't a choice. It wasn't a choice. It was something I had to do. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, just to be clear, um, she's talking about Michael Brown. That's Darren Wilson. Darren yeah. Wilson is the officer. And uh, so when I think of Occupy Wall Street, I reflect on uh, Russell Simmons. He was on TV, uh, you know, making cha uh, chanting things, and people were, like, uh, repeating after him. Were you in those crowds? That's what I'm thinking about. I actually was not. I was not in any okay. of the in the crowds that were sort of led by celebrities. Um, I actually first started going to the. So I heard about Occupy Wall Street through Tumblr as well, and I was just curious. I just wanted to see what was going on. So one day I went down to the encampment that they had. Um, they were set up literally on Wall Street, so that like the Wall Street brokers had to like step over them to get to work, and I was really surprised. I was shocked by what I saw. There was all these people that they had like water systems set up. They had um, portable gardens where they were growing food. They had a, a, like an open library, like a lending library where people were bringing books and dropping off books. And I'm ta I was talking to people and, you know, these are people that were living in this encampment as a, a demonstration. Um, and I started going there like literally every single day. Like I just couldn't stay away. I was, I started bringing food. I started bringing water. I started bringing supplies, especially like feminine supplies for the women that were there. And I just felt like I was learning so much. And then they organized a protest. It was not a celebrity led protest or anything like that. It was like an a activist, a grassroots protest um, through Brooklyn. And so then I went to the protest and that was my first protest. Um, and there were no, celebrities there there was like it was just people organizers I never saw Russell or any of the celebrities there I only saw like the actual people that were were organizing um, and then when they shut it down there were no celebrities there either you know the celebrities just kind of come nothing against celebrities or whatever but I feel like the celebrities kind of come and then they go you know it, mm. it is what it is got it got it got it uh, so you, you spoke about this a little bit earlier about uh, 
being classified as a black American who descends from slaves. What does that mean and why is it important to make that distinction when talking about black people? So basically, um, a lot of people get nationality, ethnicity, and race confused. Uh, I feel like this is something that served us up, up until fairly recently. Uh, if you look at chattel slavery and especially American chattel slavery, uh, people love to say like, oh, the Irish were slaves and slavery was practiced in Rome and Greece and all these things. The difference between chattel slavery uh, and other types of slavery that have been practiced is that number one, chattel slavery was strictly race-based. So it was, if you're of a certain race, you're born into bondage and you can never be free. You know, that's, it's sort of like that's your permanent state. And also the concept of chattel, meaning that you're property. You're not seen as a person. You're not seen as a human being. You're seen as property, an animal, like an animal or a cart or a bottle, um, something of that nature. And so when you look at American chattel slavery, sort of the way that that worked was that black is black. You know, everybody that's born black, that's born into the black race, regardless of where you come from, is born into bondage. You're seen as a slave. And so it's this idea of, well, we all have to band together. We have to stick together because it doesn't matter because at any moment, you know, Massa can pick any one of us and sell us away to another plantation and we have to be able to bond together and become family strictly based off of race. And that's something that's been really prevalent in black American communities. Um, and yet we've sort of reached this point now in the United States where that's becoming detrimental to us because now we have so many different types of ethnicities and nationalities. So even though we're all still the same race, black, we have different nationalities. Nationality means your country of origin, of course. And then we have all these different ethnicities as well that are, so for example, Latinx or quote unquote Hispanic is an ethnicity. It's not a race, it's not a nationality. So Hispanic and or Latinx people can be any race, they can be any nationality. For example, a lot of people don't know this, but in a lot of Spanish-speaking Latin countries like Colombia, there are a lot of people that are Chinese. They have like a huge Chinese population. They're considered Hispanic. They're Spanish speakers, all that. But they're Chinese. They're Asian. So we have a lot of issues right now with dealing with this sort of holdover from slavery of, well, black is black. And yet now, especially post 1965, when we had a lot of immigration reform, we have a lot of black people that are all different ethnicities and all different nationalities that are coming to the United States and that are able to benefit from policies that were put in place specifically for black Americans, descendants of American chattel slavery, to try and help us after the effects of slavery, after the effects of Jim Crow, after the effects of the war on drugs, the crack epidemic, things that are supposed to be specifically for us that other black groups, nationalities, and ethnicities did not go through, so they're not dealing with the effects of that, and yet they still get to utilize a lot of the programs and a lot of the services that are meant for us. And it's sort of like we're starting at zero. We're starting at negative five, actually. <laughs> it's like we're starting at negative five, and then you have maybe other groups other black groups, black ethnic groups, black ethnicities that are starting at zero or they're starting at five. So they're already ahead of us in the United States because they're not dealing with the emotional baggage as well as the physical baggage, as well as the financial, the fiscal baggage because they're not from here. They're not generationally dealing with what we're dealing with. So they're already starting a bit ahead of us and then they're able to also take advantage of these services that are for us that are really catapulting them ahead. And so it's sort of like, no, we need some distinctions so that we're able to, to really understand who should get what, what are the benefits, you know. And there's even an inflation of how well we as black Americans are doing when we're all lumped together in the black is black category. Because, for example, many African immigrants that come to the United States are already affluent in their home countries. They've already gotten the best education. They've already been sent to boarding school in Europe, in the UK. They already come from certain affluent families. A lot of the times, it's the most affluent people in their countries that are even able to come to the United States, especially if they're not fleeing war, civil unrest, or something of that nature, you know, they choose to come here. They already have the money for a plane ticket to come here, you know. 
they already have a certain amount of affluence and then they come here and they take advantage of a lot of programs and things that are meant for black Americans. And then when you look at numbers, the numbers say, well, black people as a whole are doing X, Y, and Z, but it's being falsely inflated by black people that are not ethnically descendants of American chattel slavery. And so we, in a lot of ways, are being left behind and the numbers don't, don't show it. That's why it's really important to start having these distinctions um, in ethnicity and in, and in nationality and understanding, you know, who is who. Not to say that, like, because people love saying that, like, black Americans, like, hate other people and all this other stuff. Not to say that we hate anybody or that we have a problem with anybody, but it's just, like, we are different. We do have different ethnic backgrounds. We do have different national backgrounds, and we need to be aware of those differences so that we can understand what's best for everybody. Holy smokes. Got you. Got you. Got you. Uh, so to quote the late, great Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, words are very important. So I'm going to ask you a few, uh, about a few words and see if you agree with some of these definitions. So the first word is racism. I heard a, a definition about racism, and uh, I thought it was accurate. And I want to see what you got to say about it. So racism is a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in a known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think that's an accurate way of describing racism? And do you think that system exists? Racism absolutely exists as a system. I think that that classification is fine, but I feel like it leaves out the fact that non-black persons of color can also practice anti-black racism and do practice anti-black racism. I feel like non-black persons of color are really skating by because everything is pinned on white people. Um, so while I do agree with the definition, I do think that non-black persons of color should also be included in there. Uh, I don't really believe in POC solidarity. I hate the term POC. Uh, I hate the term person of color. I hate when people try to call me a person of color. It's like, no, I'm not a person of color. I'm black. Call me what I am, please. And I feel like POC is used as an umbrella term. Number one, it puts the emphasis, it still puts the emphasis on white. Because when you're seen as a person of color, quote unquote, you're basically being split into two groups, white and non-white, right? So it's sort of like white is still the subjugator, white is still the standard. So even when we say like, well, racism is a system of white people, like we're still putting all this emphasis on like whiteness, when I feel like really the standard should be black or non-black because it's like if you're not black, you're able to get away with a lot of shit in the system of racism, white supremacy. If you're not black, you're able to get away with a lot. If you are a non-black Hispanic, if you are a non-black Asian, you know, if you are a non-black person of color, you're able to get away with a lot because it's like, well, at least you're not a black person. So I like uh, Dr. Joy DeGry's um, definition of racism, which is that racism is, in fact, a system of anti-blackness where people utilize the system of anti-blackness as a way to sort of catapult themselves ahead. I feel like that the way that racism operates right now. I think of it as, in our society, the United States as well as globally, there's a social hierarchy where you have whites on top, you have non-black persons of color second, all of them, and then you have black people on the bottom. So they're all complicit, all of them. Mm. Mm. So if you were given the responsibility of replacing a system of racism with another system, what would that system be, and what would be some of the key changes? Anarchy. <laughs> um, replacing the system of racism with another system. I don't like systems. I don't like isms. Maybe, maybe democratic socialism, if I had to, if you like had a gun to my head and said I had to pick one. Maybe what would that look like? What would democratic socialism look like? Everybody yeah. has a say. Everybody has a say. Everybody gets a vote. Uh, a true democracy. I don't really believe in our current 
bipartisan political system, for example. I don't understand the point of elected officials. Elected officials can't represent everybody. It's literally impossible. They can't have everyone's best interests at heart, so why not just let everyone vote for themselves on everything, on every issue? Um, and if you don't turn out to vote, you don't turn out to vote, vote, that's your choice. But don't tell me that I have to elect an official to speak for me. Let me speak for myself. Um, so I would want a true democracy where everybody gets a say in everything. Just like how right now they're mailing it, trying to mail a census to every single person or, you know, have every single person go on the Internet and mark down, quote, unquote, what they are or how they're going to, if you don't reply, they're going to, like, literally send somebody, come knocking at your door. Why can't we vote that way? Why can't we vote on, on issues that way? Why can't we vote on our budget that way? Why can't we, we already have the infrastructure in place because we do the census. Why can't we do everything that way? Why do we have to have elected officials and presidents and senators and governors and all this shit? I don't believe in that. I, I would want a true democracy where we get to speak for ourselves. Um, and I think that it's possible. It's just people are scared of that. They, they got to keep uh, the Negroes in charge. That's why they <laughs> got it like that. But, <laughs> but um, are you so familiar? We, with, are you familiar with Neely Fuller Jr.? Yes. All right. Neely Fuller Jr. talks about a concept called justice, and what he means by justice is two parts: guaranteeing that no person is mistreated, and the second part is guaranteeing that the people who need the most help gets the most constructive help. Uh, I would agree with that being the system that I would replace racism with. And then the third aspect of it is uh, getting more black people to be in control of the nine major areas of people activity. So what, what do you what do you think about uh, Neely Fuller Jr.'s uh, justice being the system that we should replace racism with? I respect Neely Fuller Jr. a lot. Um, I think that that's fine, but even when you said it just now, my first thought, my first question was, well, how do we decide who needs it the most? What's going to be the process for that? Who's going to I be, could, the, de who's going to be the decider you, of that? Yeah. I could give you some examples. Sure. So let's start with economics. We talk about home ownership. We talk about unemployment rates. We could talk about um, wealth, family wealth. If you look at those three measures that I just named, who do you think are at the bottom of those three measures in this society? Black Americans. So black Americans would get the most help. Let's talk about education. Education, uh, high school graduates, college graduates, and uh, um, graduate programs. Who do you think uh, graduates the most and are able to get postgraduate degrees? Is it black people or everybody else? Well, it's funny you say black people. Black American. Black American. Okay. <laughs> black American. Uh, it's, it's everybody else, absolutely. But I was going to say it's funny that you say black people because we're also obviously getting a lot of evidence that shows that uh, you know, black immigrants are Nigerians obviously... are highly educated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, just how you said, like, words are really important. Specificity is really important. All right. You're you keeping me on my toes today. I got that. <laughs> black American. So I'm not going to run through all the different nine areas, but I'm just... You see how no. we could just talk about specific things, and if we talk about those specific things, the people who need the most help are black Americans. So yes. those are the I people agree. who will get the most help. I agree. I totally agree. And I think that, but like I said, I feel like I, I believe in this, I believe in that concept in theory, but I feel like in actuality and practice, I, I, people would fight that tooth and nail. They already are. Even just to see black Americans finally speaking up is really bothering people. And they're coming up with all these, we're this, we're that, we're xenophobic, we're Russian bots, we're all these things all these pejoratives and, and fucking adjectives to describe us just because, we're, just because we're saying, hey, we want our own section on the census, just because we're saying, hey, we need help, just because we're saying uh, the black American students at Cornell organized a protest because they said, you know, Cornell is publishing these numbers saying that they're doing so great with diversity and that, you know, they're getting all this money from the government to lure in black students, quote unquote, and they're saying that they're using this money and they need this money because they're trying to correct 
you know, things that happened during slavery and during Jim Crow, and yet they were like, but the majority of the black students on campus are black immigrants, that their parents only came to the United States in the 80s and 90s, were still massively underrepresented on campus. They organized a counter protest against them, and those were just facts. Like, those were completely objective. They weren't saying, like, throw the immigrants on campus, anything like that. They organized a counter protest against them and forced them to, like, recant what they said and to, like, step back. So my sort of question becomes, I totally agree with the, the justice idea, system, plan, in theory. But in, in real life, in practice, how will we enforce that? Because people are already pushing back against us as it is now. How will we enforce it? I don't know. We got to get together with other black people who, uh, black Americans, black Americans who are dedicated to um, getting justice for all of us. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to get we have to get together with people who uh, whose main goal is to make sure that happens. Yeah, right, I'm yeah. just so I just feel like so weir- weary and wary of the system because even now you have so many people in these high you know black black people in these high-ranking positions that you even think that they're one of us, and then it, you know, turns around and comes out like, oh, you are Puerto Rican, like, you're not even one of us like we thought you were, you know, all these people coming out, people that we thought, you know, people that we elected, that we thought had our best interests in mind, and then it turns out they don't, and for me, that is what is a little bit terrifying, it's like there's fucking incels and ops fucking everywhere, so that's why for me, I, I, I like the idea of, you know, and I know this is hard for most people to, to fathom, but I like the idea of totally disengaging from the system, of, of pulling back from the system and trying to do, you know, like we did previously with Soul City Farms and with Black Wall Street and with 9th Street in Arkansas, of just like creating our own autonomous communities and like y'all can have it, like y'all can do whatever y'all want over there. Like give us our reparations so we can start our own communities and y'all can do whatever y'all want over there and we can do whatever we want over here and you don't bother us and we won't bother y'all. I'm gonna touch about I'm gonna touch on reparations at the end, but I want to get into Daniel Kalua. Who is uh who is Daniel Kalua and what were some of his most popular roles? Daniel Kaluuya is my arch nemesis. <laughs> uh, kidding, joking. Daniel Kaluuya is a British, I believe, Ghanaian. I want to say Ghanaian. No, no, Ugandan. He's a British Ugandan actor that his most well-known roles are for playing black Americans. He's especially well-known for Get Out, uh, which was Jordan Peele's sort of racism horror movie that came out a few years ago where he basically uh, made a horror movie about American racism. And the whole point of the movie was like looking at racism from an American perspective and especially critiquing uh, white American liberals the people that say, like, you know, I'm not racist, I would vote for Obama for a third term. But actually, they are racist, and it ends up that they are utilizing black bodies, um, sort of like an, almost like an organ harvesting. They're literally getting inside of black bodies and, like, using us. And that was sort of what catapulted him to fame. And he's done several other movies he was in widows where i think he also played a black american and that also had like a a race um slant he was in black panther which everybody knows Uh, when i first saw daniel kaluuya i actually saw him on black mirror which is a british television show but his and now he's getting ready to play fred hampton the chairman which i can't believe i literally am in shock every time i think about it And then he gave an interview saying he's tired of talking about race. He's bored of talking about race, and he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. And he doesn't think it's that important. And he's playing Fred Hampton. I don't understand. That was another thing that I wanted to harp on from the video. You were saying that you don't understand why he was uh, casted in these roles. Uh, Why do you think that a lot of Africans are casted in roles to play like historically significant black Americans? Well, David Harewood, who is also a black British actor who's been cast in a lot of black American roles that deal with race and society, he gave an interview to The Guardian, which is a British paper, where he said that he feels like um, black Brits and other black immigrants are 
a better choice and a better option for these kind of roles because they are um, unshackled from American ideas about race, and so they're able to look at it as just a part and to just play the part without having any emotional, um, what's the word I want, connection, I guess, to the role. He's like, you know, we're actors. We can just treat it as, as such. And a lot of people have, have also said that they feel like the black British actors in particular are better trained uh, than we are, that they grow up, you know, in the theater and quote unquote, in the land of Shakespeare and that they have all this prestigious theater training and school training, like as if we don't have acting schools here in the United States. Uh, Brian Tyree Henry went to Yale for acting. Yahya Abdul-Mateen went to Yale for acting. We have tons of acting schools here, but there's this idea that, that they're better than us. Like, it's plain and simple. There's this idea that they're better than us, that black Americans are like the lowest of the low, that we're the lowest on the totem pole, we're the least trained, we're the least talented, we have all this emotional baggage, um, and that they're better than us. And also, they'll work for less money than us, they're cheaper than we are, um, that's true. And they are more willing to sort of take a role and do certain things because they don't have that emotional baggage. You know, it's just, it's just a role to them. Uh, Naomi Harris, who played in Moonlight, she played Little's um, mom who was hooked on drugs. She gave, she's British, and she gave an interview saying, oh, I never heard of the crack epidemic until I got this role. I had to do research on it. So, you know, it's sort of this idea of, like, that they have this emotional distance. And in addition to that, they're just better than us. They're better trained. They're more talented. They can do American accents. Um, the lead in Snowfall is British. The lead in All American is British, which is the most ironic thing I've ever heard. It's just an idea that they're better than we are. And you have a lot of actors like Daniel Kaluuya that play into that when they say these things like, race doesn't matter, I don't want to talk about race. You know, that's tantalizing for white people. That's tantalizing for non-black persons of color. They're tired of hearing us black Americans complaining about race. They don't want to hear that shit no more. They want you to just treat the chairman as just a fictional role. Like Cynthia Revo treated Harriet Tubman like she was fiction. They gave her a spidey sense, all type of stuff, like she was not a real person. You can go on some, you know, press run, some media tours and not be angry because you don't care, because you're not emotionally affected. That makes other people feel comfortable. They're tired of us black Americans being mad about this shit. And so they're going with the other types of black people that are safer than we are, and yet they're still black so they can still be like, look, but we still have a black person, it's fine. It's a very deliberate strategy, in my opinion. When it comes to people like uh, Daniel and all these other British actors and actresses, actresses, not to give them a pass because I don't have a pass to give to them, but I kind of look at them as, um, I'll just say confused, I don't want to name call. I'll just say very, mm. very confused people who... Uh, we know where they stand. When I say we, I'm talking about black Americans. We know where they stand. But as Neely Fuller Jr. says, I like to put the focus on the white people. So I did some research because uh, these movies, like the Fred Hampton movie that's coming out, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ryan Coogler, he's a producer on the movie. The mm -hmm. Queen and Slim, Queen and Slim movie, that has uh, Lena Waithe. I Annoying believe. ass Lena Waithe. Uh, Get Out is. Uh, Jordan Peele. Uh, Jordan Peele. Yep. And then Black Panther is Ryan Coogler again. Yep. So I was like, wow, these are black producers and directors. Why are these people being casted? So I did, I did a little bit of research. Would you be surprised to know that the casting directors for each of the four films I just named are white women? Would you be surprised if I said that? No, I was not surprised. I actually did know that because I researched it as well. I wanted to know who did the casting. <laughs> John Alexa. Boyer. Yeah. John Boyega was also in Detroit, which was directed by Catherine Bigelow, a white woman, and cast by a uh, white woman as well. Detroit, which is about the Detroit riots, where they had John Boyega playing black American as well. And I mentioned, I mentioned that mainly because when it comes to just making videos about uh, Daniel Kaluuya, what Harvey says his name, all these people who are anti-black, I understand the, the anger and the the sentiment about them being very confused about racism. They, to me, I look at them as they are lost cause. But when it comes to like uh, some of these movies that are big blockbuster movies, I think we should include these type of people 
in our videos, like Lexa Fogel with Fred Hampton movie, uh, Carmen Cuba with Queen and Slim, Terry Taylor with Get Out, and Sarah Finn with Black Panther. We should get these people on interviews or whenever they walk in the red car carpet and say, hey, why did, why did you uh, cast Danny Kaluuya to be Fred Hampton? Well, I've made, I know I have a lot of videos. I have like over 900 videos. Um, and I've actually made several videos talking about white people as well um, and talking about white people that are involved in these projects as well. I've also made several videos about the black Americans that are involved in these projects as well. I've made several videos about Lena Waithe, several. I've made several videos about Jordan Peele. I've made several videos about Ryan Coogler. Uh, I did two extensive videos on Black Panther, on Get Out, uh, on Detroit. Um, I have several videos. Like, I have a video literally called, like, the video about white people where I discuss some of these things. I know it's, like, hard because I have a ton of content. But uh, I've had made videos about these people as well in addition to my video on Daniel Kaluuya. So to speak for myself, I feel like I spread the blame around equally to everyone. But I also feel like uh, Toni Morrison, may she rest in peace, I feel like she's my mentor in my head. Toni Morrison gave a lecture in 1975 at a Portland University where she says that at a certain point, essentially white people are going to white. White people are going to white. White people are going to do their thing. They're going to be racist. All white people are racist. I personally believe this. I have a video called Yes, All White People. I literally believe that all white people are racist. Not that it's something they're born with, not that it's genetic or anything like that, but we do live in a racist society. The system of racism, white supremacy is all around us, and they're conditioned from the time they're born. It's just it's second nature to them. And so at a certain point, it's sort of like, white people are going to do what they have been born to do, which is subjugate us. And at a certain point, you have to not, like, stop fighting against it, obviously, fight against it, resist it forever until the end of time, until liberation. But you also have to understand that there are race traders and class traders among us that do the dirty work for white people as well that will look you in your face and be like, I'm black like you, we're the same, you know? And so they're used as the entryway, as the gateway into our spaces. I believe Issa Rae is one of these people. I believe Donald Glover is one of these people. I've made videos about them as well. And then these are the people that are used, because we kind of have gotten to the point now where you can't just throw an Iggy Azalea. I did a whole series of videos on Iggy Azalea. You can't just throw Iggy Azalea out to the black community and be like, support this Australian bitch with this fake black scent, this, you know, fake South accent, because people are going to turn on her, which is exactly what happened. You can't just throw a white girl out there anymore in the same way. You can't just throw a white person out there in the same way because people are already hip to that. They're already awake to that. But what you can do is you can throw out a Cardi B. Oh, is she black? Is she not black? Oh, but she's saying nigga. Oh, but she's from the Bronx. I don't know. You can throw out a Bruno Mars. A lot of people have heard me talk about Bruno Mars. You know, is he black? Is he not black? He's racially ambiguous. He's basically dressing up in Trinidad James and Prince and Bobby Brown cosplay and getting all these awards thrown at him left and right, winning, you know, fucking Grammy <laughs> album of the year. You know, when Prince never won album of the year, you know, you know, people Did you say, say cosplay. Well, I did say cosplay, yes. It is cosplay. <laughs> it is cosplay. Bruno Mars bit Trinidad James' whole swag, and I will never get over it. Like, he wears his hair like Trinidad James. He dresses like Trinidad James. Like, Trinidad James did all of everything. <laughs> Seriously, Trinidad James did all of everything. Bruno Mars did 24 oh karat. 24 <sighs> karat magic, right? Trinidad James said, don't believe me, just watch, nigga, nigga, nigga. Bruno Mars, don't believe me, just watch. It's exactly the same. Trinidad James, Trinidad James, this here for them hood girls, them college girls on Spelman, on Instagram, straight flexing. Bruno Mars, this here for them hood girls. Dun, dun, dun. It's literally the same thing. But if Bruno Mars was white, we would have said no, no, no. But since he's, oh, is he or isn't he racially ambiguous, POC, these people that they send into our communities are just as equally guilty as the white people. I'm not going to give them a pass. 
I'm not going to give them a pass because they're black. I'm not going to give them a pass because they're POC, non-black POC. Everybody is complicit in black Americans staying at the bottom. And like Let I me. said, I've, I've made videos about white people, black people, non-black POC, and you brought up, I want to talk about really quick, you brought up Ryan Coogler, you brought up Lena Waithe, and you brought up Jordan Peele. Yeah. All three of those people have publicly said, not that they don't consider themselves to be black Americans, but all three of those people are basically suffering from an inferiority complex. Lena Waithe gave an interview where she said that her director, Melina Musukos, was interesting and smart and creative because she's mixed and that she's able to tell all these amazing, diverse stories because she's mixed. In this same interview, Lena Waithe said, I'm special, I'm not like other black people because I study Aaron Sorkin, who's white, because I can watch Julia Roberts, who's white, movies, and then I can turn around and watch Spike Lee. She obviously idolizes whiteness. She obviously idolizes people that are mixed. She obviously feels like she's not like the other Negroes, like she's better than us. She's a special snowflake Negro. Jordan Peele has said the same thing. Jordan Peele is also biracial. He has a white mom. Let's not leave that out. He has a white wife. Let's not leave that out. His primary audience is white people. It is not black people. He's doing racism 101, racism light for white and non-black persons of color. That's his audience. We're not his audience. He's not doing shit for us. Ryan Coogler, Michael B. Jordan as well. Both of them have also came out and gave interviews saying they feel like black people have no stories. Michael B. Jordan sat in an interview and said, black Americans have no culture. He said, we have no culture. Ryan Coogler, we have no stories. We have no history. We have no past. We don't know where we're coming from. So I wanted to do Black Panther, which is fictional. Okay, Wakanda's not real. So I wanted to do Black Panther to give the kids something to look up to. These people have an inferiority complex. And I know that. I've read all about them. I've done research into them. I'm not holding them up as no type of paragon of blackness because they're sick in the head. They don't even believe in themselves. They don't even believe in us. They, they are the same as a white person to me. So everybody is culpable. Everybody. I mean, me, I feel bad for them, but I will blame everyone equally. Let me, let me give you a different perspective here. Like I said earlier, I'm not trying to give them a pass because overall, I look I don't at think them, you are. No, I don't think you are. I'm just saying. Yeah, I give, overall, I give them, the, pop, the perspective I have about them is their lost causes, just flat out lost causes. And I, I don't have anything necessarily to say about them specifically, but you brought up Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison wrote a book called The Blue Side. Yes. And uh, P. P Cola, the, the main person in the book, the main person in the book, basically she had an inferiority, inferiority complex about being dark skinned and wanting to have blue eyes and wanting to be seen as beautiful. If someone reads this book, they might have the the interpretation or the belief system that, hey, it's black people who has the issue. It's not the white people. And my whole thing is I want to focus on the white people. I already know Jordan Peele and, you know, all the rest of the people we talked about earlier. They're lost causes, but the people who I think skate oftentimes are the people who are in charge, the final decision makers about the, um, the casting directors or whoever financing these movies. I think we should, we should put some names to it and not just say white people because when it comes well, for to Jordan, me, yeah, go ahead. Well, for me, that's why I say that I don't believe in the system, the established system as it is because when you believe in the established system as it is, that's why you're begging white people for something. That, not saying you personally are begging white people for anything. I'm just saying when you believe in the system, that the system as it is already established, that's why you're going to them to finance your movies. That's why you're going to them to produce your movies. That's why you're going to them for all this money. If black Americans had our own established system for us, our own established community for us, our own established artistic endeavors for us, where we didn't have to go to them, their opinion wouldn't even matter. What they think wouldn't matter. Who they cast in a movie wouldn't matter because we would be able to do it ourselves. People talk shit about Tyler Perry, and I don't fuck with Tyler Perry either. Tyler Perry has a lot of inferiority complex and self-esteem issues as well. He has a lot of issues with his own people. And yet, nobody can deny what Tyler Perry has built. You know, Tyler Perry started off doing church plays that he expanded into, like, ghetto plays, that he expanded into, like, play, regular plays on the stage that people loved and went to go see, that he expanded into movies that he was financing himself. We can all sit on the Internet all day laughing about his wigs, 
laughing about his production value, but at the end of the day, Tyler Perry can make whatever movie he wants. Tyler Perry can make 100 Medea movies if he wants because he doesn't have to go beg Harvey Weinstein rapist ass for money. He can put whatever bad wig on whatever bitch he wants because he doesn't have to go beg some white producer for money. Seriously, like, because he, he doesn't have to go beg for money. We're so hooked into the system that we believe that we need them. And, and I want us to disengage from that, you know. And it's hard. It's hard because we do live in a capitalist society where we don't have shit, you know. But that's why I wish we could talk more seriously about how do we disengage from this this society and this system and become autonomous because, again, we can look at Tyler Perry as an example. He recently built a huge fucking lot in Atlanta where all he does is employ black people. All he does is employ black Americans and roll out black American content, TV shows, movies, feel how you want about it, say what you want about it, but he doesn't have to go to Captain Bigelow, white bitch, and ask her to direct a movie. He doesn't have to go to the white casting directors and ask them to cast his movies. He can put whoever he wants in a movie. Another example, the Wayans family, right? They don't have to go to anybody and say, cast my movie for me. They can put whoever they want in their movie. We could say all day, scary movie sucks. The first two are good. But we can say all day, scary movie sucks. White chick sucks. Fifty Shades of Black sucks. But they can do what they want. They're not indebted to any white person. That's the difference. You feel me? I agree. I agree. We don't. We don't need to slide to Harvey's. Uh, <laughs> slide I'm just to saying. Harvey's studio. <laughs> right. I'm just saying. You know, it's like. It's like. But like, seriously, think about it. Like, do you think a movie like White Chicks would have really gotten made if they had to rely on, especially white women, to cast their movies and direct them? White women found that shit offensive. They were able to get that made because the Wayans family produces and funds their own shit. Another example, Robert Townsend, who's one of my all-time favorite, favorite, favorite directors. I was able to um, see him live in New York last year. I went to the screen of a screening of his documentary, Making the Five Heartbeats, where he talked about how he self-funded the – have you seen the Five Heartbeats? Please tell me you have. Of course. Okay. You know he self-funded that movie himself on credit cards. He did not have any major production financial backing for that movie. He financed the whole movie himself. He went around doing all the casting himself. Him and Keenan Ivory Wayans, they wrote the script together. Part, partway through it, Keenan had to leave because he started doing The Living Color, which he wrote, financed, produced, and got out there himself. So it was this whole process of basically Robert Townsend financed everything himself. He wrote everything himself. He cast every single person in that movie himself. Highly recommend this documentary, Making the Five Heartbeats, for anyone that hasn't seen it, if you want to like, see how that movie got made. He made that movie start to finish alone. And at every turn, there were people telling him, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't cast this person. You can't cast that person. You can't do this. You can't do that. And he was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway because you can't stop me because you're not holding me over a bag. You're not paying me. You're not, you're not doing anything for me. I'm doing it myself. You know, and I feel like that's something that black Americans really need to work on getting back to. I personally am a separatist. I believe that integration was a mistake. I have a video on that as well on my channel. But I believe that something about integrating, we were never truly integrated. We were assimilated into the dominant white culture. We were assimilated into the dominant white society. And in a lot of ways, we were made to believe that we need white people, that we need them, that we need to be a part of their dominant society to thrive and to survive. And I have an issue with that. I do. I have an issue with that, especially when we do have contemporary examples of black creatives, since right now we're talking about creatives and film and filmmakers, that are doing it differently. You know, BAPS, Robert Townsend wrote and directed and financed BAPS himself. Harlem Knight which got horrible reviews and got panned by critics, Eddie Murphy wrote, produced, cast, and financed it himself. We have so many black classics that were created by us, produced by us, financed for us, versus the shit that's coming out now that we're routing through these um, white systems, and then we're wondering why the movies are not hitting. Like, there's a Boomerang. Reason. Boomerang. Boomerang. Another Boomerang. example, you know, Eddie yep. Murphy fought to put Chris Rock in Boomerang. That's his first role. And then Chris Rock went on to like have this really huge prolific career, 
But that's because Eddie Murphy fought for that, and Eddie Murphy cast the movie himself. If it, if it had been some white woman casting it, Eddie Murphy wouldn't have been there, and Chris Rock wouldn't have been there. So, but that's also part of no, us needing to know our history and where we came from and what we've done. Because now we have, again, we have a lot of people that are sitting back like, well, we need, we need white people for this, we need white people for that. And also being scared, you know, like people hear that Robert Townsend totally financed the five heartbeat on credit cards and that's scary. That's a scary thought. That's a scary idea. But he felt like this is a story that needs to be told. He said, you know, I love The Temptations. I wanted to do a movie sort of honoring them and showing this aspect of our black culture. I couldn't get it made. I wanted to make it so I figured out a way to get it done. And I feel like that's what we need to get back to instead of running to, you know, white person for this and that. People still make indie movies. People still make indie TV shows. If anything, now it should be easier than ever because you can upload it on YouTube. You know, you can do all these things. But people want the the stability that they feel comes with going with a white-owned production house or a white-owned casting agency or, or, you know, things of that nature. They want that stability. They're scared. I'm not, I don't feel that fear. I don't have that inside of me. Hey, um, are you good for like 10 more minutes? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, good, because you, you hit me with the CP time initially, so I need to make I up. I know, no, I know. We're fine. We're good. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. All right. Two things. One thing I want to address is uh, getting back to the video. You said something that I thought was uh, interesting and it's not really talked about a lot. Non-black people or non-black Americans using the N-word, why is this something that's uh, egregious and why is this something that we need to talk about as black Americans, about who can use it and who can? So I have a video on this as well. <laughs> Uh, it's called, I believe, You Can't Say That, something like that. Um, I actually personally feel that anybody that runs the risk of being called the N-word can say it. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I asked the question in my video, You Can't Say That, uh, how do people feel about uh, foreign blacks and black immigrants using the word? And it was a pretty even split. A lot of people felt like they were fine with it as long as you are black racially. But a lot of people felt like, um, black immigrants or foreign blacks should not be able to say it because nigger is a very specific uh, American word. It's not negro, it's not kaffir, you know, we have different words in different languages for different things. And in America, the word is nigger. It's a very specific word to our culture and our history. Just like there's other words, Uncle Tom, coon, um, raccoon. Uh, blackie, uh, somebody calling you skillet, you know, these are things that are very specific, like the etymology, the, the history and the nature of the word is American. And so a lot of people felt that foreign blacks don't understand the gravity of the word and that they should not be allowed to use it. They don't feel like it's fair. And I feel like I can understand that because it's sort of like um, Kaffir is basically the Afrikaner, the South, the South African word for nigger. And somebody like Trevor Noah, who is South African, would feel the sting of somebody calling him a Kaffir more than I would, a black American. I know what the word means. I know that the word is offensive. But I don't like personally have that emotional connection to the word. So it would be easy for me, for example, to be like, oh, it's no big deal. Like, it's not a big deal that somebody called you a Kaffir. Like, let it go. Not that I would ever say that, but I don't have that emotional connection to the word. And so you have a lot of people that might be black, but they're not black American. They're not descendant of American chattel slavery. They don't understand, the, again, the emotional baggage, the history that comes along with this term. And a lot of them, you know, getting on Twitter, using their platform to be like, I think it's fine that Cardi B says the N-word. It's like nobody asked you. Like, you don't have the emotional resonance with the word that we do. So you don't get a say in it. I don't mind people using it that run the risk of being called it, but I've also seen people be like, you know, black Brits or blacks of other of ethnicities and nationalities be like, well, such and such called me the N-word and I didn't care. And it's like, because you don't understand. You just don't understand. You don't have the same history, the same baggage as we do. You don't know what that's like. You just, you just don't understand. And if you want to even get a little bit deeper into the idea of, intergenerational trauma and in that there have been studies that have shown that trauma is actually written into your genes and it can be passed down through lineage like literally 
it's just like you really don't have the connection that we do. You don't have the understanding that we have. You don't have the feeling that we have. So maybe think about that before you come out your face talking about the word and it's fine or it's not fine or we need to do this or we need to do that. I feel like it's, it's only fair, you know. I would never tell Trevor Noah, don't be offended by somebody calling you a capper. It's not my place. And yet you have people that feel like it's their place to tell black Americans how to feel about the N-word, and I don't think it's appropriate. Well, anybody that knows me, I'm real dark. But uh, I don't want nobody calling me the quote-unquote N-word if you're not a black American because uh, I'm going to yeah. take that as – I'm going to take it as disrespect. Uh, even if you've been called the N-word, uh, uh, I, I heard interviews about DJ Khaled. He was like, uh, he was called the sand N. Uh, I mean, that's called, not the same, but... I know. Yeah. But I, that's the point I'm making. If you, no, if it's you, not. If you're, if, you're, if you're a black American, then uh, we need to have more, I guess, uh, black self-respect, as Dr. Walson would say, yeah, for I ourselves. Agree. And... Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not good with that at all. But uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is reparations. Um, wow, with this whole coronavirus going on now, and uh, the possibility of Americans getting I don't know a thousand dollars, et cetera, does that does that kind of damage this whole notion about hey reparations is not possible? You know, we don't have the money. Absolutely. We don't have we don't have we don't have the support. The Republicans have never passed it. Listen, if they really send out these checks for COVID nineteen, Black Americans gonna be standing right there, arms folded, like, okay, so you guys have proven that it can be done. And especially now that we're in a census year where people are going to be filling out these census forms, which is why so many black Americans have been pushing for an ethnic recognition on the census, let us be able to identify our households as black Americans specifically, as descendants of American chattel slavery specifically, because then you'll have the information right there on who is a black American and who isn't a black American, and then you'll be able to send us checks. There's literally no reason. There will be no reason. If they really push this bill through of saying send a one to two thousand dollar check to every, you know, working American in the United States, they're saying two thousand for adults and a thousand for kids possibly and up to eighteen thousand dollars for a family of four. And it will be done through your tax information and through the census information. So it's like everybody has to file taxes and everybody has to fill out this census form. So give us the opportunity to mark our ethnicity on the census so you know where we all are, and then there's literally no reason why you can't send us our check. It literally blows the argument out of the water. I feel like that's the only good thing to, like, come out of this fucking COVID-19 shit is that so many people are finally seeing that all these things they've been saying to us for months and months and years and years, years, is fucking bullshit. It's bullshit. It's not true. It's not real. The government can make anything happen that they want, Literally, they can make anything happen. They lock motherfuckers down real fast. They close schools and businesses down real fast. Now they're rushing legislature to get checks out to everybody. There's no reason, no reason for us to not get reparations. They make money up out of thin air, too, like $1.5 trillion to bail out the banks, $1 trillion for this, $10 billion for that. There's no reason. All the reasons are, are bullshit, period. So, yeah, I just, I, just, I just want people to think about that because I, I hear a lot about people saying that, uh, oh, it's not possible. It will never get passed and they don't have the money. But something like this come up, they got the money. And oh, their uh, money magically falls out the sky all of a sudden. They got the money. Yeah. They yeah. print money. Even though every time you print more money, it drives the value of the current paper money down. But money, I mean, even if you want to get – more deeper into that concept, money is, is a concept. Money is numbers on a computer. Money is paper, you know, like money can be printed at any moment in time. It's, it's just a system. It's, capitalism and the free market is just a system as it is. Before capitalism, we had feudalism, where basically the land was the money, where you had the barter and the trade system. I'll trade you this for that. They introduced the system of capitalism where they printed paper money, and then when computers came along and they digitized everything, I used to work for the, for the bank. I literally used to work for Bank of America, so I'm very familiar with the FCAA and all these regulations. You know, they made up this system. At any moment, the system can change. And at any moment, they can decide 
we will do this or that, you know? People saying it's impossible, they're incorrect. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Holy smokes. All right. Um, well, thanks for coming on. Uh, Learn a lot. Thank you for having me. Sure, sure. We now know why uh, Daniel is your uh, arch nemesis, as you said. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I have several of them. I hate that Lena Waite, too. She sucks. So if uh, people wanted to find more about your videos and your social media, how would they go about doing that? So you can find me on YouTube. You can type in So About That. Um, you can type in Seren Sensei, and you'll find me on YouTube. You can type in Seren Sensei. My Instagram name is Sensei Ashtamasu, which is a little bit hard to spell, but you can type in Seren, S-E-R-E-N, Sensei on Instagram and on YouTube, and you'll most likely find me. I'm permanently banned from Twitter, so you will not find me on Twitter because I called Bruno Mars a culture vulture, and I got banned. And I yeah. used to... I used to say stuff all the time, like, you know, the New York Times is a white nationalist rag and our government is a sham. And they they got to the, gotta get the angry black women out of there. Yeah, they banned me real quick. <laughs> they said I was abusing Bruno Mars. I was ab abusing a celebrity, apparently. It was abusive language to call him a culture vulture. So you will not find me on Twitter. But you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram. You can find my book on Amazon. Even though Jeff Bezos is the devil, he is Satan walking the earth. Um, you can find me on Tumblr as well. If you type in Seren with four S's, you will find me on Tumblr. So you can find me. I'm around. And if you find me on YouTube, all these links to all these things. Uh, I also have a Patreon. If you type in Seren, Sensei on Patreon, you can find me. But if you find me on YouTube, there will be links to all these things on my YouTube account as well. Perfect, perfect. I'll link it in the description. Well, uh, thanks again for coming on, and uh, stay safe out there. Thank you. Same to you.